We're gonna see Madrid play Liverpool on Wednesday. I'm expecting Madrid to get beaten here against Liverpool. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that Liverpool are going to win. It's at Anfield as well. It's gonna be a hell of a game. Don't get me wrong, but I think we're gonna see Madrid kind of bend the knee to a, a superior team. That'd be ridiculous though, given the, the context and the history between both these teams during the Klopp era where Damn, Robert yeah. ultimately did have their number, That's you true. know, but it would be the turning of a page here if Liverpool can get that result. I think Liverpool beats them. And, you know, a team that is riddled with injuries right now, they had to start Goulet, for example, exactly. on the right wing, who played great. He, he played did. amazing, but I, I think this is a really, really big match that Liverpool will step up in and get the result. Hello, and welcome back to The Give and Go. I'm your coach, Reno, so here with my boy. Soltero. What's up, y'all? Folks, it is a season of gratitude. A time to give thanks. I'm thankful for producer Rudd. I'm thankful for this beautiful location that we are at back at the parents' house that we prepare for the holiday season. Thanksgiving to you all. A beautiful time to rejoice because there's many, many things to be grateful about. Something that I'm grateful about is the fact that the footballing gods have given us not just one, but two downfalls with Manchester City and now Real Madrid. And brother, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah? Right hey, good, right good win today, yeah, brother. Good. Thank, good you so win, much, brother. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful, beautiful time right now. And I get to enjoy it on the eve of Thanksgiving with Liverpool defeating Real Madrid as predicted 2-0 at Anfield. Easy. This is one of the most comfortable 2-0 wins I've seen. And I know, I know there's a penalty for Madrid. They could have tied it, but I was never scared for Liverpool. The moment that they took the pitch, man, they just look so confident. Mm -hmm. And the longer the game went on, you could just see Liverpool really grow into this match. They're one of the best teams off the ball. And in my opinion, bro, they just completely dominated Real Madrid. 2-0. Could have been 3 or 4 if Courtois didn't show up. So for me, this was just an absolute dominant performance from Liverpool against the reigning UEFA Champions winners in Real Madrid. Real Madrid. And the scenes were incredible. Anfield was lit. And I, I do think the absolute insist for Real Madrid show themselves today man no Vinny Jr. at the end of the day and Mbappe is given the task of finally going into his natural role of being in the left wing and he got dominated by my boy Connor Bradley saying Trent you can go to Real Madrid if you want I'm gonna take over in this right back position putting on an incredible performance and the whole back line once again Kanate Virgil van Dijk just shutting things down and Kelleher saving his second penalty in the row and then you go to the midfield Curtis Jones McAllister and Gravenberg just dominating this prestigious Real Madrid midfield and then up top obviously Salah Gakpo Luis Diaz Nunez all could have had more goals in this game but it was absolutely domination at the end of the day I think truly Real Madrid was in a way lucky to have almost made it 1-1 at one point with that penalty that ultimately Mbappe ends up missing man which Dude. I think just falls perfectly in line with the narrative that we have built for him yeah. and what we've seen from him basically since the end of the 2022 FIFA World Cup final man yeah the only credit I can give to Madrid is the fact that they kept it 2-0 that's it because I think realistically, they didn't offer much offensively. Sure, they had a lot of the ball, mm -hmm. especially in that first half, but Liverpool are so comfortable without it. They've proved it over the last two months that Liverpool have a plan when they're in defensive shape, and of course, they have a plan when they have their wingers on the ball. When you get Jones, when you get McAllister on the ball, they're one of the most complete, balanced teams in Europe. We're seeing it every single time they take the field, and this game was no different, bro. I completely agree. The fact that Madrid could have made it 1-1, I think is honestly way more lucky than anything else. Loki Robertson was just a little rash yeah. on that chat. Like he lunged way, way too dramatically. Mm -hmm. Didn't need to do that. Honestly, the contact was minimal too. Loki Vasquez sells the shit out of it. Uh, but Mbappe doesn't do anything with it, man. Kelleher steps up big, bro. And from that moment on, I was like, oh, perfect, bro. Like, perfect. This is Madrid right now. They're still figuring themselves out. Is Mbappe really that guy for Madrid? The answer's been no for the last couple of months. And then the answers of Liverpool are the exact same. They are the best team in the world right now. I hope people can finally open their eyes and see that because we've been saying that for the past month now and it's taken a lot of convincing. <laughs> but slowly, I hope people can start realizing that as of this moment, right now in terms of form and the way that these guys are playing Liverpool is the best team in the world the best team in Europe and for Real Madrid my question is given that a lot of this does have to do with the injuries and what they're dealing with at hand is it time to be concerned 
because right now, if I look at the standings, they're in 24th place, the last place that you can be in to qualify for the next round. Five games have been played, three games left. Is it time to be concerned? Damn. I mean, concerned in the sense of they probably won't win silverware this year. Yes, I think you should definitely be concerned. But they'll they'll probably still qualify for the next stage. I'm really curious to see what the remaining three matches are because I do oh, think yeah. that would matter a lot. When it's not going to get easier next time around, bro. Do you know the next team they're facing? No, no. Th- enlighten me. Atalanta. Oh, yes. Yes. I'll tell bro. you, man. Come on. I'll tell you, man. It's going to yes. get real hard. It's going to get real hard, bro. And we're seeing two very fun downfalls right now between Damn. Manchester City and Real Madrid. But being honest, Atalanta can take it to Madrid as well. Easy. Atalanta is one of the more offensive sides over the last year or two. And they're going off in Serie A. They're having a decent run here in the Champions League. The form of Madrid is going to equalize this game 100%. And for Liverpool, man, I've kind of felt this way over the last couple weeks. It's just getting better and better and better. I don't see a team beating them. Realistically, I'm talking like this is the Boston Celtics right now. (laughs) Like if they just lock in, I don't think any club out there can actually beat Liverpool. And that's, that's crazy to say because... Usually, I don't feel this way until February, March, when teams really go through it in the winter and start to gain rhythm, close out the domestic league, and go far in the Champions League. But we're still in November, and I've felt this way low-key since the end of October with Liverpool, and they keep on impressing me every single time. There's no doubt in my mind when I see them play now, and it's just, it's ridiculous. It's so impressive that they are hitting this type of stride this early into the season, bro. We were kind of, you know, joking, but I think you were definitely serious when you said in the last episode that Liverpool might win the title this weekend against Manchester City. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I think that's where we are truly at in terms of how good Liverpool are playing, bro. I just don't see anybody beating them. you're absolutely right. I, I see the same thing. And even putting my bias aside, I, I think when you look at this Liverpool team, they're the most consistent team in Europe and the most dominant team as well. We have highlighted uh, about a month ago about the tough schedule that they had. <laughs> 10 games where it was going to be a true test after a questionable schedule to start the season. Nine out of 10 games completed. Eight wins and one draw to Arsenal away from home with yes. one big game remaining in Manchester City that I think will win us the Premier League in terms of points, but then also just mentality. And when you look at the other big teams in Europe, I can't remember the last time that we've seen this many big teams honestly show signs of question. When you look at Manchester City, it's very obvious what they're going through. They haven't won in six <laughs> games, bro. That's 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 not even... that We don't need to talk about that. Yeah. Real Madrid and all the questions that they have right now. They're starting 11. The players within that starting 11. The injuries. Barcelona was going to be the biggest test for Liverpool and I think still is if we go upon a one-on-one matchup. But even then, they've gotten some shaky results against Sociedad and Celta Vigo too. Bayern Munich lost to Barcelona and in pretty embarrassing fashion as well. So I think there's a limitation to this Bayern Munich side too. Arsenal, I think, has shown that they are so reliant on Odegaard that I think it's a problem ultimately. They're going to have to rely on a guy, one single guy to put in 10 out of 10 performances week in, week out. I don't think that's sustainable. And then you look over at Italy, I think that's where we might see some actual formidable threats with Inter so far having a good start to the Champions League and not conceding a single goal. And then Atalanta having a really high ceiling as well. I need to see more big games from those two teams teams to fully um, develop my take on them. But as of right now, man, Liverpool have played the toughest teams and they have the best players in the world playing at that level right now. And let's move on to other notable results in the UEFA Champions League, man. When you see all the results on paper after what happened, which one stands out next after this headline of Liverpool defeats Real Madrid? I think it has to be the implosion of Manchester City, dude. Oh my God. 75th minute. 3-0. 3-0. Three 3-0. Three. City. 3 I low-key stopped watching it because I was like, all right, there's tighter <laughs> games going on right now. <laughs> yeah. So I clicked away. I was like, this game's done. Yeah. City have found a little bit of their mojo back. Just a little bit. Yeah. And then, uh, seriously, the greatest breakdown of a Pep Guardiola side I have ever seen. Ever, man. All three goals, embarrassing. Super embarrassing. That first one where the back line of Manchester City get careless with the yeah. ball. They try to like do a little bit of you know cheeky passing with one another. Valiol. And then it completely backfires. Ederson's just kind of left in no man's land. He's completely strung out. And Feyenoord take advantage. Yeah. They, they take advantage of that chance. The second goal... 
I, I will say that's just a crazy goal. I mean, the fact that like Ederson kicks it, hits off the inside of the post, that was just a crazy, wacky goal. There's really nothing City could do about that. Although you wish that just wouldn't happen. Yeah. Like you would expect Ederson to just make clean contact and not even let it sneak in on the inside of his positioning. And then the the third goal, man. Just the third. What is what's what Ederson is he doing? doing? Oh. A headless chicken. What a blunder! Yeah. What a what an absolute howler from Ederson, and that's just complete blame on him. Yeah. He's just so far out. Doesn't get anywhere near the ball. And Feyenoord low key do well because they still had much to do to get the ball in the back of the net, and they tie it three three. Yeah, Igor Paishao with one of the best assists this week, sending a beautifully floated ball to the middle and gets headed in to make it three three. Uh, Manchester City doing their own version of no nut November, no win November, no <laughs> win November. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but San Marino has more wins this month than uh, the beautiful, the prestigious Manchester City. It has been a horrid, horrid time for Manchester City, so much so that we saw Pep Guardiola leave cuts and scratches on his head. Yeah. What did you make of that, man? Did you see just how physical he gets with himself? And in the press conference saying that he wants to hurt himself, he said it jokingly, but I think there is an element of when he's stressed, bro, he, he doesn't know where to where to, where to to express that stress. As, well, as a manager, he's never had this bad of a streak. And so we're seeing a Pep Guardiola that the world has never seen. Mm -hmm. We've seen him stress, but that's usually because of one loss. We've, we're mm -hmm. seeing six. Six, six times the usual amount. So, yeah, I think Guardiola is going to have to figure out this new energy that he's experiencing because he's simply not used yeah, to it. Yeah. Bro. Is he there, doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do. Any, and this isn't me. Hey, I'm just the messenger, right? And I'm just doing this for content. But okay, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> any sort of conversation to be had in regards to moving on from Pep Guardiola, putting him aside. Six games like this from a prestigious club, from a big club in the world. Six results like this. Not a good look, right? Just stay with me here. No, right, 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 right. I'm seeing tweets. I'm seeing some things being said online. Should Pep Guardiola be on the hot seat? <laughs> you know what's crazy is usually this is how managers get fired. Usually? Even if they win a title in the previous season, when their team, not their tactics, when the players themselves implode the way that we saw against Feyenoord, usually that's a sign that the coach has lost a locker room. Yes. So in any other situation, I would say, you know, in any other situation, I would say that he'd be on the hot seat. Yeah. But this is Pep Guardiola we're talking about. And the fact that he just led Manchester City to one of the greatest dynasties the Premier League has ever seen, I do think the board will understand the bad streak that they're on right now, but also understand what Guardiola has done for the club over mm -hmm. the last 70 mm -hmm. years, man. So I don't think he's truly on the hot seat. Ah. Also, he just signed a contract extension. Yeah, no, there's no way. There's no way. There's <laughs> no way. One. It's not going to happen, but I do think at least the criticisms are going to get louder because, yes, six straight unimpressive results. About to become seven, by the way. Mm -hmm. About oh. to become seven. Yeah, 100 About to become bro. seven with Liverpool coming actually hosting Manchester City at the weekend, it's going to become seven, bro. And I'm excited to just see more of those criticisms because like you mentioned in our last episode, we are loving this Manchester City downfall, man. It is something to enjoy. Manchester City with their sixth unimpressive result in a row. Speaking of six, Atleti put in six past Sparta Prague. Yeah, Sparta Prague. I'm not getting excited. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. I'm not going to get excited. What an anomaly, honestly. Yeah, six. Uh, six is crazy. When I saw that, I was like, damn, like, we haven't done that in a while, bro. But again, I'm not excited because Sparta Prague, yes, they were Czech champions last year, uh, but they're like in third or fourth place this year. And when you're third or fourth place in the Czech League, no disrespect, you know, you're, you're probably not playing good football. No, no. So I think this is just a situation of that matter. Yeah. Right? We're just playing. It's boys against men. 100%. And at the very least, uh, Atleti stays in the qualification zone. There's that to take Hey, man, I, I would love some February football. At least get some February football. I'd love at that. Least. Give me that at least. And from there, we'll see what happens. We had an insanely high scoring, uh, I think, match day, honestly. Arsenal put five past Sporting CP. We finally get the true reveal 
of who we thought Sporting CP would be, which is this losing to an Arsenal side that, my God, just is so drastic when they have Odegaard on the pitch and Bukayo Saka cooking as well. They went to Portugal. They went to Lisbon. They went to the hotel. They flew on the plane. They landed in the stadium, and they conquered, bro. Five goals past the Sporting CP side, who was basically on fire before this, shutting them down completely and low-key owning them to the point that Gabriel did the Jokeres uh, celebration, putting the mask over his face too man a little disrespectful yeah. i would even say so that's what we got from that game what was your takeaway from that i mean this is just what i was talking about when we mentioned sporting last time uh when you can lose a game this badly it just means you can't go deep deep in a tournament i just at this point can't really trust sporting maybe at best they can be feisty yeah. you know they might be able to have one upset i'm not saying they don't have that in them but that's all they got in them right and this is why I think this is just watching football for too long when I can't I, I can't get excited about uh, small yeah. teams like Sporting. I know they're a big team in Portugal, but in the grand scheme of things, yeah. bro, this is the true reality. Losing 5-1 to Arsenal, man. Yeah. And, and for Arsenal, this, this is good, you know? They just got to keep chugging along. <laughs> they have a lot of work to do because they lost a lot of points over the last month in the Champions League and in the Premier League. But uh, this is just good signs yeah. for their own morale. Maybe the Premier League's done, but... Hey, if they can lock in in the Champions League, bro, I truly do think Arsenal can go very, very sure. far. I said that early on. Arsenal this year is not a Prem team. They're a Champions League team yeah. because they're, they're, the heights that they can reach in knockout football, I think, are very, very high. For Sporting, I will say what sucks is that this result literally comes the following Champions League game after Amorim moves. I know, dude. It's like, damn, dude. You couldn't, you couldn't hold down the fort for just a few match days, man? Yeah, and, dude, and this game was super hyped because of Sporting's form, there was like a lot of scout talk about, all right, we're going to look at how Sporting are playing. We're going to look at Victor Gioqueres and see if he could fit in the Premier League. And then they get absolutely whopped <laughs> by Arsenal. It's just like, damn. <laughs> and, and, and in Lisbon, by the way. Yeah, that's, that's And then the just thing. like, damn, bro. Like, they just could not contain Arsenal whatsoever. The wings of Arsenal absolutely smothered Sporting. They had no response. Yeah, good to see Arsenal, I think, should, should be looking hopeful, at least going into the deeper rounds of the UEFA Champions League. Barca getting back to business after questionable results in La Liga, defeating Brest 3-0. You mentioned this game as one to look for following those disappointing results. Anything positive, positive to get here after defeating this league goon side? I can't get anything out of this one, man. I was actually really excited to see Brest have had an incredible run so far up to this point in the Champions League specifically. They've been all right in league mm. Un, um, but they offered nothing offensively. Like, I will say Brest fought. They tried really hard to contain Barcelona. And honestly, for a majority of this game, they did. Yeah. They were able to hold Barcelona, but that's all they could do. They couldn't threaten them whatsoever on the ball. Barcelona just had to be patient, and the goals would have come, and they did. I think this so. game was this was a very straightforward game for Barcelona. Yeah, and honestly, this game was about the moments. You know, you got to see Pedri dominate the ball, do his classic magic-like stuff on the ball. It's cool to see. But then Leva. Uh, surpassing 100 goals in the UEFA Champions League, 101 goals now because I believe he had a brace, enters a very prestigious club with only two other players in it of scoring more than 100 goals in the UEFA Champions League. I want to give him a moment of praise. That's what that's what this game was about for me, ultimately, was just Leva dominating in this tournament, finding a way to put the ball into the back of the net time and time again as he cements himself as one of the greatest strikers that this generation this game has ever seen doing it against Brest, but also having done it against such elite teams in the past he still got it bro and he's continued his form as he's the pichichi leader right now in la liga but just keeps scoring goals in the champions league shout out my boy leva man congratulations if he's watching this video bro <laughs> hey, shout out man hey i fuck with you for real you my boy congratulations 100 plus goals in the champions league yeah that's crazy man i mean if you really think about it over a decade of just scoring goals. Nuts. Scoring goals like it's nothing. Over a decade. I remember the year he popped off in 2012-2013 with Dortmund. And he has literally not faltered since. No. It's ridiculous, man. Couple dips here and there. But, I mean, the fact that he's been this good for this long. I mean, it makes sense that he's in rare air over 100 goals in the UEFA Champions League. It's so deserved. One of the most clinical strikers probably in the history of football. It's nuts, man. When you really think about it, if, you know, CR7 and Messi were never born, 
this would be the leading goal scorer in the toughest tournament in the world. Yeah. And we're looking at him, you know? He's still playing at this old age of his, you could say. Still elite, still incredible. One of the greatest players we've ever seen, in my opinion. Deserved a Ballon d'Or when he uh, ultimately didn't get it during the COVID year, I believe. Yes, but uh, that's just bad time. Yeah, it'd be man. nice for him to have that accolade. Regardless, he's won so many trophies. I think at the end of the day, he's cool with it. Moving on, we had Bayern. Leva's old team defeat PSG 1-0 at home at the Allianz Arena with Kim Min Jae actually scoring off a corner kick. We've mentioned this PSG team as basically a joke in the Champions League. And Bayern's been an interesting one because they, you know, have gotten somewhat positive results and then they lose to Barcelona. They've seemed to be back and forth. I look at the recent results, seven straight clean sheets in a row. And then a defender stepping up and scoring a goal for them to give them the lead and ultimately the result in this game. Yeah. What's the takeaway here? Is Bayern getting it together a little bit more as we see them kind of gel together? Or is this another sign of just PSG being low-key mid and just falling to a better team? I think it's a bit of both. The biggest takeaway I got from this match was just how disappointing PSG are. Again, if you watched Luis Enrique on the sideline, as the 90 minutes wore on, dude, he was just getting more and more lost, more and more stressed. It's complete mismanagement of this squad. Dembele, once again, just has really bad moments. A second yellow card, red card for the next 20 minutes. It just does, it's not a good look for PSG. And overall, the general flow of this match, Bayern looked way more dangerous PSG had a few things here and there but that's PSG that's all they've been these last couple of months is just a little bit of moments but that's it nothing truly concrete they're so individualistic there's zero chemistry in this side and it really showed against this game against Bayern and the reason why I don't want to give Bayern too much praise is because I think a better team a more clinical team like Atalanta like Liverpool for example would have absolutely killed this PSG side Bayern created so many chances but the reason why I'm not fully sold on this Byron side is because they're just not, they're not clinical. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're missing like a true goal scorer outside of Harry Kane. I think if Kane had one winger, like a young mean son, for example, <laughs> <laughs> like one really I mean, bad, good winger. You final with that, with that lineup, <laughs> exactly. man. With one really good clinical winger, I think Bayern would be very dangerous, but they just simply don't have clinical wingers. Yeah, they're always rotating them out, man. Yeah. They're always rotating them out. They put up numbers in the Bundesliga, but in these big games, it shows Coleman got the start, and yeah. he, I thought, was lackluster up front as well. And yeah, you you see moments where Sane has a good, you know, has he some gets highlights so many chances, or, or but Musi, yeah, Musiala too, Nabri, and then the other one, Olise. Yeah. Olise. Just a list of good players, but one of them hasn't really stepped up fully to be the go to winger for them yeah. to just pair up alongside Harry Kane, who is going off this year, by the way. Shout out to him. Staying in Germany, Bayer Leverkusen uh, defeats RB Salzburg 5 0. <laughs> Crazy results, man. Crazy amount of goals. The only thing I really want to highlight from this is uh, the play of Florian Wirtz. I think sometimes we can see young players pop off and then have a bit of a drop off the following season. Five goals, one assist in just the Champions League so far. And I believe four goals in the Bundesliga as well. It's still very early. He has continued his momentum from not just last season, but from the Euros as well, starting for Germany. He is looking really, really good right now, be it against a pretty mediocre RB Salzburg side when you look at it. Leverkusen are really interesting, man, because of moments like Verts that he can provide to Mm -hmm. this squad. And you include some just other players like Victor Boniface. On any given day, these players can go off against anybody. And I think if they get the right draw in the knockout stage, I think they could basically do what Dortmund did last year. I, oh, like, yeah. I won't be surprised if Leverkusen go on a run, but they'll, they'll need a couple no, of like, good things for them in the draw for sure. I agree. No, that, that's a good point because I do feel that same, same ability from yeah. them. But there is a fear factor of you know seeing how they played against Liverpool, for example. Was, it was leaps and bounds, bro, in terms of talent and ability. Yeah. But if they get a favorable draw, man, I, you're right. I, I could see something special in the works for them where they can at least be a feisty team if they get matched up with Liverpool later down the line. Yes. They get matched up against Inter, an Italian team. They could definitely hold their own. I could see something like that, a dormant esque run. I, I, I like that take. Speaking of Dortmund, they got a 3-0 result away from home against Dinamo Zagreb to hold themselves in the top eight of automatic automatic qualification (laughs) after five match days they are in fourth place right now with 12 points four victories and only one loss which was that 
blunder of a game where they went up on Real Madrid 2-0 and then Real Madrid did their classic comeback. Yeah. Looking at their resume, look at what they've done so far. Dorman actually looking pretty good once again and yet another Champions League season. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're getting so good at Champions League specifically, <laughs> bro. They just know how to navigate this whole thing. Maybe they're just really good. Maybe they have a really good travel system, man. Yep. They get the players feeling really good no matter what. This game behind closed doors, it was held in Zagreb. I think they had a stadium band or they had a crowd band. So it's just, you know, death of football when that happens, man. It's just so sad to see when there's an empty stadium, man. I, I hate it. I hate it. But Dorman took care of business. It didn't matter. 3 0, a banger from Bino Gittens. Like, come on, man. What else can you ask yeah, for? Yeah. Dorman, Dorman getting the job done. But I, I just think that implosion of Madrid is going to stick gonna, in yeah. my mind, bro. And I just don't know if I can fully trust them. Even, maybe, maybe even if they get top eight. True. No, but, but maybe they needed that. To, to solidify that that flaw, that that thing that got exposed in that game. Maybe they needed that experience in the group stage so that now they can hold things down in the knockout stages. If you're a Dortmund fan, that's what you're saying to yourself. For sure. If you're looking at it from my perspective, I'm also worried. <laughs> <laughs> it also worries me as well. Let's look at the Italians. Atalanta killing young boys 6-1. That's a crazy sentence. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> Atalanta defeating young boys 6-1. AC Milan defeats Bratislava 3-2. And again, that shouldn't have been that close. But Bratislava made it a game. And then Inter winning against Leipzig 1-0. Yeah, it's the same pattern with AC Milan, man. They have such great players, but I think overall, they just lack a bit of consistency that you 100%. find with the better teams. Milan's just going to be very susceptible throughout the rest of the season is what I'm telling myself. Even though Pulisic is having an incredible season, I really want Milan to succeed. There's just too many weaknesses when it comes to this Milan side. Uh, Bratislava almost got something out of them. When I look at Inter, they just keep getting these 1-0 results, mm -hmm. man. And they do it once again. I just need to see them play a team that's really in form. Because when they played Arsenal, Arsenal was going through it. Yes. And honestly, Arsenal played better, in my opinion. They were unlucky to not get a draw. Inter right now obviously have the defense locked down. I completely get that. But I need to see a team stretch Inter. And I want to see how Inter respond to that. So I do think Inter's defense are very promising and can, can get them very, very far. Just the way that it did when they went all the way to the final against Manchester City. They got through through their defense, not really their offense. So it's rinse and repeat with their defense man and for Atalanta yeah young boys suck <laughs> Dude, they, they fucking suck, Dude, they're man. Bad, man. They're, they're so bad. bad. Yeah. So I'm glad Atalanta took advantage completely of them and put six past Bro, them. Bro, without Lookman, by the way. Oof. No Lookman. Retegi got, uh, I believe, a goal or two in this game. He has 14 goals, three assists in all competitions, having his Oof. best season so far. And Charles de Ketteler was the man of the match with the game of his life. Two goals, three assists in a game where his team scored six goals, man. That, that's crazy. Five out of six of those were because of his involvement. Shout out to the Ketelair at AC Milan. I kind of want to echo your thoughts as well. Disappointing when you look at their defense because you mentioned patterns with AC Milan. The pattern is offensively, Pulisic is going to get involved yeah. because he did it once again, man. Scoring a goal. Beautiful to see. But defensively, bro, I don't think I can get on board with the Pavlovic experience mm -hmm. because I tried to get on board with that back when he was guiding Serbia's back line and I felt the real repercussions of investing my faith in Pavlovic. I think he was at Salzburg back then. He gets the move over to AC Milan, but low key, I think he's got too big of shoes to fill for this Italian defense and I just can't trust him ultimately because right alongside him, you have Theo Hernandez, who's a great player. You have a great goalkeeper, Mike Magnan. They shouldn't be this bad defensively, but every single time that they've competed in the Champions League, there's been questions in the back line and I think he's a big part of why ultimately they do disappoint when it comes to the defensive line. And then for Inter, I agree too, man. I actually agree with everything you said. When I looked at their schedule after seeing that they hadn't conceded a single goal this year so far and that they're undefeated and that they're up top with Liverpool basically, I was like, let me look at their schedule see who <laughs> have they really faced off against. Yeah, to start off, they tied Manchester City, which... We've seen now what City truly is. Right. They beat Red Star, one of the worst teams it's in the tournament. To they beat Young Boys, one of the worst teams in the tournament. They beat Arsenal without Odegaard, who I think becomes a mid-tier team once they don't have Martin Odegaard. And now Leipzig, who I think have proven to be German frauds after a really good start to the season. Dude, Leipzig. So, <laughs> so for, Inter, I, for Inter, I agree. I'm questionable. I need to see them prove themselves, but I also agree that they can reach a really strong height in this tournament can. because I love their starting 11. I do like their defensive unit. They have deserved 
the results they've gotten so far. I just would like to see them get truly tested and come out on top. Yeah, and you, you think about what happened last year. Honestly, Inter choked against Atletico. If, if Inter had beaten Atleti, I think Inter could have beaten Dortmund and Loki could have gone to the final, man. Like, yeah. truly. So this Inter side definitely has what it takes to go all the way in the Champions League. So I'm going to keep an eye out on them, but... I just wish they provide a little bit more offensively. That's it. That's it. Yeah, and staying with Italy, the last Italian team that is in this tournament, Bologna, I think, has just proven to be a really disappointing and honestly sad story Uh, this year with the way they've played in the Champions League and in Serie A because they hosted Lille today, who we've been keeping an eye on. And Lille, this French side, went to Italy and got a 2-1 result with Macau getting a brace in this game. Three full points for Lille as they now sit in 12th place at the moment, looking really promising. And Bologna in 33rd, one of the last four teams in this tournament. Dude, they just scored their first goal in this game, too. No way. That was their first one? They were scoreless up until this match. Don't tell me that, man. It's bad for Bologna. It's bad, man. God, and that that makes sense because I thought the way the fans (laughs) sounded when they scored was way too passionate, (laughs) way too spirited for what I've seen from this team all season. But that's why then. It's been building for for games, dude. And they finally got it. Finally. But, hey, Lil, though... Lil are fun. I, I don't fun. think they're going to do anything crazy like a semifinal run. But I think they could maybe make a surprise quarterfinal appearance. They'll have to work hard, though. Mm-hmm. Do, do not get mm-hmm. me wrong, but Lil have some really exciting players. And now looking at the remaining games that happened today that we haven't highlighted, we had Red Star Belgrade win 5-1 to one against Stuttgart. Stuttgart catching these hands, bro. bro. I don't know what the hell happened. I, I saw Stuttgart had a lot of players out. I think Leveling, their main winger, was out. Uh, El Bilatoure, their one of their strikers, was okay. out. Also, Undav, their starting That's striker, was out. So yeah. it's like they had three big starters out in this match. But damn, damn. They, they completely lost it, bro. Yeah. For Red Star to score that many goals, like against Stuttgart, who haven't been that bad, Mm-mm. that that one really shocked me. Is it more shocking than Stumgras defeating Girona? Uh, honestly, man, the way Girona are playing, I low key want to say no. Yeah. I low key yeah. want to say no. Uh, Girona, there was a moment Brian Hill on the left wing dances, gets by the defender, megs the goalkeeper as he's playing a cross, mm-hmm. like a low cross. He megs the goalkeeper, finds his teammate wide open, open goal, right? Okay. Misses it. How? Yeah, he, 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 yeah. <laughs> he like tried to kick it, but it just went straight up. Oh, it God, went straight man. up, and that's where Girona are right yeah. now. That is exactly <laughs> where they're at right now. So that's why I say I'm not surprised with Stormgras getting a nice three points yes, because Girona cannot figure it out this year. And I believe this is the first three points that Stormgras gets in this tournament. I mean, Stuttgart, Girona, and Bologna kind of on a similar vibe. Having good seasons last year, but now just not being able to compete up to the highest level. Obviously, Stuttgart is the best out of the bunch, but they're all out of the qualification zone yeah. right now at this moment. So it's a it's tough to see. Aston Villa ties Juve nil nil at home. Yeah, I saw flashes of this match. My eyes were glued for Liverpool Madrid, but ah, it's just again similar patterns here with Juventus just not having a threatening offense. They can defend almost against anybody. The difference is is that. They just don't have killers like Inter Milan do. At least Inter Milan have, you know, maybe Marcus Turam, who's honestly pretty crafty if you think about it. Also, you consider they have Hakan Chalanoglu who mm-hmm. can facilitate. You really don't have any of that, bro. They have good ball- footballers, but nothing truly piercing, nothing truly threatening. So nil nil doesn't surprise me, especially when Villa are in the form that they're in, bro. Like, they, 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 just, just, I take more away from this from Villa's perspective, like, Kill them, bro. Kill them, man. They haven't hosted Champions League games this often in such a long time. Like, go off on these Italians, man. And they just didn't ultimately, man. Nil, nil. It's enough, though, for Villa because they still are in ninth place. They remain in the top 10. But this is now the form that they're in. They've won one. They've lost one game in the Champions League in their last two matches. It's a little concerning in the sense that I don't know what comes next. If they face off against a team that is feisty and is willing to take advantage of their defense, they could end up losing once again. And this could be the start of their Champions League downfall. That's the fear here. But maybe this is more so about just managing games, getting points when they need to, and seeing this right out. Because there's only three games left, and they've done enough to be in the top 10. Yeah, Villa is so disappointing for me because... 
they should be at the level of Atalanta, basically. You know, they have very similar type of players in the sense that they're very dynamic. But the clear difference is that Atalanta is an actual team that can defend and have players that play very well with each other up top. Mm -hmm. Villa, the more that they play, the more that I realize that they're just pretty individualistic and they just rely on one person's skill to get a lot of the goals. They rely on Watkins to just be a sniper, but he can't do that every single game. They rely on Leon Bailey to just take players on -on one-on-one, whereas you look at Atalanta, dude, they're moving the ball around. It's truly beautiful football to watch. It's a massive difference now, Atalanta versus Aston Villa, and that's where we get these really disappointing results with Aston Villa and it's just I, I agree I think if they play a team that's actually good Villa's not winning yeah. I just no, don't no. see a scenario where Villa could actually fight up to a really good team's level and win I don't see it happening you got Celtic tying club Bruges 1-1 Monaco losing to Benfica 2-3 and PSV Eindhoven defeating Shakhtar Donetsk 3-2 I saw, I didn't see any of these matches. I saw, I think Shakhtar had like a 2-0 lead, I think, at one point. They and did. PSV apparently came all they the did. way back. Ricardo Pepe, game winner. Yeah? Yeah. Hey, let's go, man. Let's <laughs> go. But not surprising because Shakhtar have been terrible. They, they, they've they truly been terrible. I saw Monaco. that Celtic scored a really bad own goal, basically. Uh, Bruges, I guess that's the only goal that they got. Not surprising, though, because Bruges have been decent when they mm-hmm. play. You know, they're a very, very hardworking team. And I don't think, I, honestly, I think you can say the same thing about Celtic. 1-1 makes sense to me in that match. And Monaco Benfica. What a big result for Benfica, man. I just saw the goals on this one. I think Monaco had a red card at a certain point, but they took the lead at a certain point. Two really good deliveries from Benfica, and they steal this game in Monaco. Really good result for Benfica. A disappointing, though, for Monaco. I'm really disappointing. Puts Benfica at 14th right now, and Monaco remains in the top eight, but Monaco is scaring me a little bit. This is like the second time seeing them get a result like this. Not a loss. Last time it ended up being a tie, but they get into these really tight shootouts, bro. Mm. And Benfica got the best of them today. On the other side, I think the surprise of all the teams that I've listed so far, Celtic in 20th place. They might make it through, bro. That'd be fun. Yeah, it'd be really, really fun. They're above Feyenoord. They're above Club Brugge. They're above Real Madrid (laughs) after five games. Let me see who they play next because I'd love to see them at least make it, have a chance at the next stage. They have Dinamo Zagreb next, which I think is very very winnable. Young boys after that. And then to finish it off, Aston Villa. Okay, so they're definitely getting to the next Dude, round. They could get they could get in. It might be the play in for sure. And yes. If they get a good play in draw, I could see them in round of sixteen. They I really could be could. fun. They could be fun. What a crazy match day in the UEFA Champions League. We're in the fifth match day right now, but what follows will be the sixth, and I think that one's going to be even crazier than the one that we just saw. Liverpool gets a massive victory over Real Madrid, and folks, let us know. Any other big headlines that stood out to you, any other results, any other details that we might have missed, let us know in the comments down below. We'll catch you next time for our Champions League recap. Peace.